Hello everyone, welcome to In Between. I'm here with three of the big boys on Raya. If you guys want to introduce yourselves. I'm Don Hall, director on Raya and The Last Dragon. Carlos Lopez Estrada, the other director. Hui Gwen, I'm the screenwriter. It's a real privilege to get to talk to all of you. I'm very, very you know, honored and happy to talk to each and every one of you. Um, that didn't sound sincere, but I mean, <laughs> I mean <laughs> reading it off of a <laughs> privilege is ours. <laughs> Six years of searching. Please let this be it. Oh, my DC two. Who said that? We really need your help. Ah, I'm gonna be real with you. I'm not like the best dragon. Have you ever done like a group project, but there's like that one kid who didn't pitch in as much, but still ended up with the same grade? Uh, we're doomed. Listen, I understand this uh, This production was uh, it was in development for quite a long time in, in terms of stuff. Now mm -hmm. I know obviously things come in and out and um, development can be a broad term of in someone's head for a long time and then it just starts bringing people on board. But when did each of you come on board and, and like how much time were you on then? That's what I'm really curious about. So we came, we all three came on at the same time, you know. Yeah, as, that as makes it easier. Um, same day. Same <laughs> literal day. Um, same moment. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm trying to do the timeline. It was around, th around this time, probably, was it two years ago? I think yeah, it was, it was like two years ago. I can't believe it was man. Damn. That passed, that time fly. I it's know. It's like a year and a half before we released, right? Or, yeah. So we came on about a year and a half before the movie was released. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we we had looked at, like, all of the stuff that had been developed previous and, and uh, you know, kind of did a, did a little deep dive. And then, you know, uh, as a team, we kind of gathered and said, okay, what do we want to do? What story do we want to tell? And we started just with that thematic of trust um, and built out built out from there. I mean, that, that's a nice fancy answer. Like, you know, like I think that was yeah. super, but I think it was the, the moment we got pulled in, you know, a year and a half before and we kind of came in and we all were like, oh, we, we're going to do this. And we all yeah. literally squirreled ourselves off into a room to see if, you know, gut check if we wanted to do it or we could do it if we had the idea. And then we kind of basically, you know, in, in the fun way of it all is it, we sifted around and we kind of, you know, dared each other with every bad idea, very every rendition of this film that we could think of. Um, from like, what would be the most horrible version of Riot? Let's not make that one, but let's just pitch yeah. that one out to see what that would sound like. And, you know, it, it kind of, uh, it, 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 there was a very stereotypical samurai story that you could tell, uh, which we, it could easily have fallen into. And so we knew that we had to go sure opposite of that. Like we had to make it young and fresh and have a, a vibrant voice and something that, you know, you know, coming from the culture, I know there's a lot of samurai stories out there with women with swords. It, to me, was one of the most common tropes ever. The biggest boring trope was, you know, they're quiet and badasses that, you know, you know, took no gruff. And it was just like, oh, cool. So you are Uma Thurman from Kill Bill. Gotcha. That's, it's hard for a kid to want to be that, right? Like, they want to yeah. be a group with a sword, but there's no personality there to, to, to attain as a kid. And so we went and made sure that, you know, what we were making was something that, you know, had all the things that makes you love a Disney movie. It was moving, it was funny. It had a lot of personality, it had characters that you wanted to spend time with, but also have that kind of cool ass adventure um, that, that, you know, adults and kids would enjoy to watch, of you know, saving the world. So that's, so you guys kind of sat down, you had a look at everything. And like you said, you decided here's the through line. This is the through line that we're going to have. We're going to pull together. But like a year and a half is not a lot of time to kind of get all that then into, because obviously all the research and everything, but to cram it into a storyline and make that A, cohesive, you know, B, look as good as it did is, and then on top of it with the pandemic and, you know, right at the end, that must have been just like, why is this happening to me? <laughs> I think it was uh, challenging. I'm not gonna lie. Yeah, it was challenging on many levels. Uh, and yeah. it was also sort of like a mix of of us working with this incredible team who mm. who had been immersed in this world for so so long that we were able to to like collaborate with on such an intimate level, and also just our the the ways that we came into the movie and and our direct connections with it. I think we all fell in love with it, and that just made it yeah. so easy to really just 
completely, completely dedicate, you know, every, every second of the next year and a half to it. I watched Raya, obviously, when it came out. And my partner, she's from Malaysia. She's Malay Indian. And I was really curious to kind of see, like, what she would pull out of it. Because there's so much in the world of Raya that references everything in Southeast mm -hmm. Asia, you know. Mm -hmm. um, like, how much of that then was filtered through? I know you guys talk about a story trust. And how much then you talk about trust and crew. Was it just crew coming up with ideas? You know, because there's a lot in those worlds. They're very separate different areas consistently you're moving through so how was that to navigate um I, it was actually pretty thrilling i mean you know um yeah. and uh i think it's also a testament to uh, you know our our entire well our entire studio actually but specifically yeah. we're talking about art here um they just uh, you know i think everybody loves wanting to get it right you know mm -hmm. loves that feeling <laughs> when when Thank you're God. You know, yeah when you're profiling a, a culture <laughs> and you get it right you know i think that was just everybody really put themselves uh uh they really embraced that idea and so it was always a back and forth it was always like you know we had you know piles of research and uh you know pictures and and all kinds of you know hard research that we've done but also this southeast asian story trust that mm -hmm. we would pass things back and forth to and a lot of it happened without us, you know, it wasn't like we dictated it. It was just, there was a really close collaboration between our art team and that, uh, you know, our experts in the Southeast Asian Story Trust. Mm -hmm. So there was a, like a lot of, you know, pieces of art getting, you know, shown and thoughts and notes. And, and there was just a real good back and forth. And that's in yeah. addition to all the screenings we did and, you know, where they saw the screenings and, and gave us notes on that. So it was just sort of a constant collaboration through that you know whole year and a half and even before that one thing that really stood out for me was like the obviously apart from the aesthetic design of of the worlds where you were able to pull in things like the yn kulit um shadow puppet animation like how early did you guys think to kind of pull that in was that already part of the stuff when you guys came on board or like did you feel okay this is authentic to the culture i feel like this is a really good way to tell the history of the world it, well, it was it was a, a little bit of both. I mean, I know that the shadow puppets, for example, we came up with the idea relatively early in the process, right? And yeah. it was that first day we were talking. I think we were like, it'd be cool to. Yeah, and we had one of our visive artists from the region mm. take a deep, deep dive into all different styles of shadow puppetry. And we tried to explore, I think it was her idea that rather than keeping the the traditional silhouettes we would actually get to see the the puppets themselves puppets. because yeah. oftentimes the you don't get to see the detail and the color and like all the beauty of the puppets because you just get to see their their uh shadow but then we decided to do it reverse and then from there on we we assembled a specific team of people who would only work on the prologue because that had such a specific look and such a specific aesthetic um, and I think like that, some of the ideas in the movie are, you know, five or six years old and and stuck from the very, very beginning. And some of them happened rather later, late in the process. All the other heightened sort of like retellings when you go into this like more stylized, flattered animation look, that was also a thing that um, came rather late and then we had to do some R&D as we were in production. So I think it's a little bit of both is letting sort of like all the research and all the 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 learned stuff that that the team brought back from the from the trips influence the the storytelling and then also as the story develops we realized that we needed different tools we were like well uh, we want the prologue to feel a little bit like mythical and a little bit like different from the real world. So how do we do that? And so it's some, some of it is just answering to some practical questions. Mm. And I think that's where we, what's what I love about animation is that you can take some really big, diverse stylistic swings and it all yeah. plays together, you know, probably, you know, more than even live action. It's, it's, uh, I, it's forgiving in terms of like kind of big stylistic choices uh, in the same film. So I, I love taking advantage of that opportunity. I love in the film that you kind of really play with the different styles of animation, you know, with the kind of 
why I call it um, shadow puppet tree start at the mythology and obviously then like you've said the you know the kind of more flattened perspective when it jumps into the characters explaining their plan but to me when I watch a film like this um, I can't help but think that it takes the most from the language of live action. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, it, our tools are getting better and better, you know, our visual tools. And, uh, you know, I think there was a desire that we all had to like push them, push them to the limit. Let's see how far <laughs> we can go until we can break it. Um, and it's just exciting. It's just visually exciting because uh, to be able to, you know, approximate the live action, you know, camera in terms of all kinds of camera techniques, um, you know, pushing the blacks um, so that things really do, you know, you get some really nice heightened contrast. Um, I think that to us is just super fun as filmmakers. And I know Carlos came from live action. So a lot of that stuff was very um, uh, second nature. Um, to yeah, him. I think from the, from the very beginning, we, we had this sort of like desire to like push the boundaries of what a Disney movie could be. And, and mm -hmm. in terms of tone, in terms of, of the visuals, in terms of the action, and our team really, really just like saw every opportunity to to try something that hadn't been tried before in, in mm -hmm. this type of animated movie. And it, it went from like some of the the philosophy behind using camera and lenses and the type of shots all the way to the very end when we were color grading and we, we decided mm -hmm. to use a cinematic grain that I remember when, when we were first looking at it, so many people in our team were like, whoa, are you sure? Are you sure you want to push that far? And, and, and I think it was just this, this like shared mentality that, that we wanted to really, really uh, make this as exciting and as unexpected as possible. So it's, I think it's really great to, to see that people yeah, I think it also it's also the filmmakers we were profiling, right? Like the ones that were influencing us. Like sometimes you go into one of these animated films and you look at like Miyazaki or you look at other and you know animation films to get like you know inspiration of how you're going to artistically put up there. But with this film, we were definitely talking. You know, we were looking at like Edgar Wright films and Taika films and Steven Spielberg films and definitely Raiders of the Lost Ark to kind of get like that visual vibe, the feel, the energy, the pacing of it all, uh, and the surprise. Mm -hmm. And and something I really like there is the idea um of challenging what people think a disney film is you know like there's no focused romance plot there's no music really there's not a hero standing out there singing their thoughts to the world um, and i'm curious for you carlos then because you come from live action and obviously you've come from a lot of <laughs> music videos how did you feel that being you know coming into a disney project essentially doesn't have embedded music videos I, no i mean i think we we realized early on Quee don and i that our sensibilities yeah. even though we come from such different backgrounds and and our skill sets are so 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 in, entirely um unique to one another that we had very similar sensibilities and when we started pulling references of of directors and and just previous work that we thought should influence the movie. Um, we were very aligned. I remember Don, the the very first day said like, we need a badass soundtrack. We like, let's yeah. look at, let's look at contemporary stuff. Let's look at hip hop. Um, and you know, we didn't go quite as far as, as hip hop, but in the, the very, the first iterations of the movie, we definitely tried some Kanye West songs in there. Uh, <laughs> yes, and right. then we were like, they were like, okay, maybe, maybe not. It, it just became evident that, um, it just became evident that we were all excited about breathing some really, uh, fresh life into this this type of, of movie and and that really just allowed us all to to pitch in ideas that as Kui mentioned earlier that we were just trying to one-up each other like how can we make this feel more exciting more graphic more uh, unexpected and and that was sort of like the philosophy that i think our entire team utilized as we were putting the movie together yeah and instead of differences being divisive like um, instead they create a unity kind of like what you're saying in the film uh, and I really like when you know working as a crew reflects a theme in a film um, and actually speaking of reflection um, you know Namari is really just a mirror image of uh, Raya at times and I'm so curious because I heard a story where 
you guys said that you had to kind of pare back Namari at the start to make it look less cool so more people would be on Raya's side. Is that true? Is it? I think it's very true. I think that like, like I think uh, I think we, she's still our secret favorite character in the film, you know, because of that. You know, there's, there's definitely a uh, there was a I remember there's a, a very specific film, scene in the film that we had to cut uh, early on where uh, Namari's racing back to you know her homeland of Fang and. Uh, you know, we wanted to see the danger of the Droon. And so the mm. Droon attack her and her people, and she ends up saving them all, like doing, you know, super athletic, like martial arts things to kind of save them. But then as soon as we were done with that, we're like, oh, crap, we're only, you know, 15 minutes in the film, and now we're all on Namari's side, and it's called Ryan the Last Dragon. <laughs> we got to we gotta fix that. <laughs> so, so you know, you, you kind of have to sometimes kill your darlings, and, and that, that was definitely one of them. But 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 she was she and it's interesting because in a lot of ways when the movie was getting developed i think she was more the prototype of what they were profiling when the the team was researching you know the you know the classic samurai classic east asian hero uh it was this like you know kind of namari as character it was but then when you saw her in screening after screening she uh, she wasn't quite vibrant enough, but what she was was a super badass that you could move over to our quote unquote antagonist that at the end when we knew we'd have to cheer for, her, she still was a someone we would admire, someone we could sympathize with, someone who was cool because all that research and work was in it. But then when we had to develop Raya, we knew that we had to do something else. But she is a character that I think not just us, but everyone on our team uh, absolutely love. And of course, Gemma was amazing uh, voicing her. Yeah, she's definitely one of the standout characters. Oh, yeah, I've definitely seen a lot of t-shirts with her, like homemade t-shirts with Namari. So um, many <laughs> so many people with the Namari haircut. Oh man, the haircut yeah. was mm, so good. Not that I'm one for yeah. haircuts, but <laughs> um, yeah, and it's something I was really, really excited to kind of ask you guys then was, the idea of you know mythology and when you're looking at someone like southeast asia and all the rich mythologies that they have it's so deep with things like the naga and everything around dragons and, and water and it's so totally different to kind of the western idea of dragons um did you find it hard translating the western sensibilities into understanding like the the Eastern philosophies and, you know, Eastern mythology, especially. No, no, I, I, I found it really cool because it, um, like you said, it's, it's a very different, um, it's just a very different, um, portrayal of a dragon, you know, in, mm -hmm. in Western culture, generally the dragon is, uh, you know, is a, is a foe. It's some formidable opponent to be conquered, to get treasure or you know, whatever. Um, and 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 thinking about it in a complete 180, where it's like, no, no, this is a it's a divine being, you know, a spiritual being that that um, doesn't it has less of a connection to fire than than it does to water, and this idea of how life giving water is, and and um, and how dragons represent harmony. So I, I think for me, it was it was really cool to be able to put a different spin on on what is a sort of a worldwide myth you know the dragon myth it goes you know worldwide but but uh it's very specific that in terms of you know the naga and um uh, i think we all love that and then put it in the hands of you know aquafina and you get something really <laughs> <unique>. <laughs> yeah the drone is just so foreign to me um like when you think about creating a, a primary antagonist for the story um and you draw upon a force of nature, you know, it's, it's pretty wild and especially the design and everything like that. And I'm so curious for me, like, where did that come from? The drone was, was sort of like an evolution of, of an idea that went through many, many different forms. Um, at some point they were a more sentient, at some point they were um, not quite as, as sort of like ethereal and, and there are much more like physical forces to to battle. At some point, they were made out of some like magma like like dried magma like ash, um, and and we ended up with their final form happened sort of like early early in our process. Just like when when we realized that there needed to be in order for the for the the dragons to be really needed in order for the humanity to be um at real risk there needed to be this this 
threat that mm -hmm. that you couldn't battle with a sword that you couldn't you couldn't you know defeat with good fighting skills that it was just bigger than and scarier than anything that humans could uh could handle and and therefore they really needed sort of like a, a miracle in order to get back back on track and and mm. and then they sort of like we we started thinking about the design we started thinking about the color we started thinking about making them sort of like this this just ever existing threat that mm -hmm. that just became so terrifying and i became i remember the first time we started seeing the the designs of of the drone that you see in the movie um it just felt like stuff of nightmares and it just mm -hmm. it just felt like you could put yourself in in the people of commander's shoes and knowing that um they just lived under this existential threat that that really required something unlike anything that had they they've been around in order to to get them back on track so anyway i think that was yeah. like uh that was one one of the characters that i think went through the most the most change well yeah i think carlos hit on it it's like for the story if you were if you're telling a story about trust uh, it was less about an uber villain and more about putting this world that is already divided under duress, under an existential threat, and and push them to the brink. And uh, that's what the Droon gave us. It, it, and and so we didn't need a big bad, and we didn't need you know them to be power hungry or anything like that. They just needed to exist. And then of course, you know, arts or life began to imitate art and. Uh, the pandemic hit and you know we were all dealing with an existential crisis <laughs> yeah and then the real drone arrived mm -hmm. yeah yeah and thinking still thinking about the drone like something that really stood out to me was the idea of when the drone kind of passed through someone and essentially turned them into stone and they ended up just standing like this you know i was trying to interpret your art as best that i could and the best that I could come up with is the idea of, you know, when they end up like this, it kind of looks like a giving pose. Like you have to give trust and you gift confidence, kind of like the message of the film. Um, and I'm curious, was that intentional or not at all? <laughs> and this one's for me. I, I actually really like the, the gift analogy. Um, for us, I think it was a little less that than um, a desire to, like some of our first uh, explorations with people turning to stone where um, they were, you know, it frozen in the the um, sort of pose or an expression of when they turned to stone. It was oh, horrific. God, yeah, like, <laughs> like Pompeii or something. It yeah. was horrific. So uh, we thought, you know, that we, yeah, we can't do that. And, um, but then, you know, just in, in discussions, we thought, well, what if it's more like they're peacefully sleeping, you know, and it, and it gives you a little bit more, because it was important for Raya to believe, to hold on to this um, idea that her dad, if she can complete the mission and get the dragon, that her dad can come back. And we felt like that kind of resting pose helped with that as well. You know, it gave a sense that they're, they're asleep and dormant, yeah. but that they can be brought back. Um, mm. That was really our kind of... Um, the driving force as I remember it, but I like the gift thing. <laughs> well, thank you. You know, I was, you know, given everything, I was just trying to figure out the meaning behind it because, you know, every part of animation is created and um, like everything that you see in the film is created. So that means that someone had to put thought into every single thing. And with something that big, you know, that permeates the entire film, I was like, there definitely has to be something here. Well, except for the end, you know. <laughs> yeah, we broke the rule there. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. It was, yeah, we knew. <laughs> okay, last question. Have you guys seen The Legend of Korra? Because young Raya looks a lot like her. And everybody wants to know, is that a reference? I've never seen it. I think it, I think it was it was sheer sheer coincidence. And, and people started posting photos about it. I was like, oh, yeah, they, yeah. they, uh, they look like they could exist in the same world. But no, we hadn't seen it. And, and obviously, I, I think that mostly happened on the first teaser came up but i feel like once uh more of our world than once the movie came out i think it was just very clear that the the stories could not be you know more more different and that right is like wholly original so oh yeah yeah it's not a comparison of character it's more just a question of homage you know yeah that first yeah. costume just looked very similar but yeah, yeah. it was 
happenstance. <laughs> yeah, a really cool happenstance. You know, I think many times people see meaning in things that we don't even see meaning in. And <laughs> when it's great, we own it. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> but, <laughs> no, but this time I really didn't think any of us knew. No, no, no it, was, it was a surprise because we all ended up having to go, hey, let's look that up. Oh, they're not incorrect. <laughs> And guys, thank you so much for everything um, for both what you and your crew did kind of bring this to the screen. Um, thank you so much. Obviously, it's very important for, um, you know, Southeast Asia and bringing the, that kind of part of the world, those cultures, that people on the screen is really, really important. So thank you so much. Like being part of that must be so cool. It is. Yeah, it is. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for that. Thank you so much for having us. Yeah. <laughs> well, you're so welcome. Thank you so much for your time, guys. And listen, uh, well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Cole. Thanks, Cole. Nice to meet you. Go on. Slan. Bye, bye, bye.